Around this time a year ago, I went through untold suffering to put together a list of the worst anime of 2018. It was an experience I never want to repeat and something I would never wish on my worst enemy. But a stupid lot of people watched that video and I gotta eat, so I guess I'm doing it forever now. This year did give me some pretty good bad anime to choose from, like that show about a lonely middle school teacher and his time-traveling 14-year-old grandma wife, Nobunaga Sensei's Young Bride. You know, the one where the entire plot of the second episode is a little girl visits an older man's apartment to get naked and talk about how dumb Age of Consent laws are? No? Not ringing any bells? There's also Ui no San Wabukyo, a light-hearted romantic comedy about a science prodigy sexually harassing her oblivious classmate until he goes out with her. No, really, that's the premise. What if Senku was a girl and also a sex pest? The first joke in the show is she tries to make him drink her pee. Now, for the sake of my own sanity, I've chosen to limit these rankings to full-length anime only, so neither of those shorter series ultimately made the cut, but... I have to know they exist, and hey, now you do too. Anyway, if you've watched my other roasts, you might remember Handshakers, the terrible, nauseating nightmare child of the old Higurashi character sprites and this CGI tiger statue. Well, guess what? They made another one of those, and it's at the bottom of this list, so buckle up! This is the top five worst anime of 2019. As I said, the first show in our roasting pan today is the frigidly anticipated sequel to Handshakers, titled... Uh, is that a word? I- oh, hold on, they put the pronunciation under it. Weed? Ah, yep, that makes so much more sense. I'm dumb, obviously that's how you pronounce those letters. What doesn't make so much sense is making a sequel to Handshakers at all? And not just because it was terrible, it was also more or less a complete finished story, and Tazuna's character arc kind of left him as an unstoppable Kirito tier Mary Sue, so any follow-up would kind of feel tacked on and forced. To remedy this, Wise attempts to be one of those generational sequels that picks up after a time skip with a new cast of characters who are almost exactly the same as the old ones. In this case, the timid wannabe mechanic Tazuna has been supplanted by Yukia, a timid wannabe DJ whose Nimrod is a sword made of CDs instead of gears because, yeah, that's about the level of character design effort I expected from this series. Yuki is an irregular handshaker who can enter the Technicolor Thunderdrome of the Ziggurat by holding hands with anyone, not just one specific partner. Also, he's the adopted son of the BDSM weirdos who tried to murder Tazuna and Koyori way back in Handshakers Episode 1 because, yeah, turns out they were important. And that's far from the only deep-cut callback that all three hardcore Handshakers fans will appreciate. Wise spends a good chunk of its time catching up with such iconic characters as The Quiet Girl, definitely not Sota and Poplar from working, and who could forget, it's time to marry your sister. And yes, for those of you who've been wondering, Lily and Masaru did, in fact, get hitched after Handshakers, but it turns out he was adopted all along, so that actually changes very little, and it's still really fucking weird and uncomfortable. As excited as I was to see these familiar faces return, I did worry that focusing on them wouldn't leave much time to develop the new cast, but thankfully Gohans has managed to effectively balance out the show's narrative so that everyone's about as paper thin as everyone else around them. As was the case with its predecessor, Wise is some 40% exposition, 30% people repeating that exposition to other people, 20% inane rom-com bullshit, and 10% garbage fight scenes where the characters barely interact with each other like some kind of Pokemon game. It's not all the same as before, though. Bringing in Horimichi Kanazawa to co-direct alongside Shingo Suzuki seems to have helped to rein in some of Handshaker's worst aesthetic excesses. Take its camera, for example. The eye-melting CGI tracking shots from the first season aren't totally gone, but they're less frequent now, and when they do appear, the camera tends to move more slowly through them so as not to make you vomit. And the animation within those scenes is often, relatively speaking, a lot more fluid and natural than it was before. Less Link, my boy, and more early 2000s studio trying to figure out these newfangled computery boxes. If you can ignore the everything in the backgrounds, it almost looks up to par with one of those Studio Dean shows that didn't save anime. Sometimes. This shift toward relatively better animation and less drunk cinematography does cost the series a bit of that motion sickness factor that was such a strong part of Handshaker's brand identity, but Wise more than makes up for that by allowing us to more clearly see the characters sliding all over the place, like 
well, like pieces of 2D animation placed on top of a pre-rendered CGI video by people who don't actually know how to do that. Despite the improvements to its animation, the compositing in Wise is still some of the worst in anime. In lieu of actual color grading, they're still using those ugly rainbow puke gradient filters to tie the lighting together, which doesn't even work half the time. Even when they are colored correctly, the characters still constantly clip through things they're supposed to be interacting with, those things still look like they were ripped straight out of a PS2 game, and the wide-angle Google Street View photo background still managed to somehow look even less believable than the CGI elements. You would think that a show about a DJ would at least have competent music and sound design, but eh, sadly that hasn't improved much either. It still feels like the show's producers just bought a library of royalty-free lo-fi hip-hop beats to study slash jam to and then threw them randomly into the episode timelines with little regard for their emotional context. And I'm not really in a position to throw stones here. I did literally just loop the town music from Mega Man Battle Network under the entirety of my fall Things I Liked video, but in my defense, I'm not an entire anime studio making an original TV series. And that's what really sticks in my craw about this whole handshakers business. It's one thing for a licensed anime to be this crappy, but original anime is another matter entirely. Making original anime in the current industry all but demands some degree of creative passion, and some of that is evident here, but it's smeared on thick in some places and all but non-existent in others. The half-assed compositing, the Unity Asset Store tier CGI, and the brain-dead use of music all smack of a distinct lack of shits given on the part of the production staff. Possibly because they're not paid enough to care, but that's just an educated guess. Meanwhile, the show's writing and storyboarding teams are trying super hard. Some might say too hard, but I don't know. I applaud anyone who can get really passionate about making a statement with their art, even a dumb one. And while it's delivered with all the subtlety of Kufa Vampire's surname, the show does send a heartfelt message about how love comes in all shapes and sizes, and all that really matters is finding the right person for you even if that shape just happens to look a bit like siblings getting married, but I'm sure the writers of Handshakers just picked that example out of a hat, and their choice to focus several episodes on that specific kind of relationship has nothing to do with how sexy anyone's siblings or cousins may or may not be. Point is, I don't think that trying too hard is really the problem with the writing here. The real problem is that the writers clearly have no idea how to actually do any of the things that they're trying to do. Like, they still don't know how to write actual characters, so everyone is still defined by one trait or gimmick, and the resulting absence of romantic chemistry renders all of their messages about love completely inert. And while they're busy not improving their writing, they leave figuring out all the technical shit they don't know how to do to people in other departments who, as we covered, don't really seem to give a shit. It's in the conflict between those two sides of the production that this franchise's distinctive artistic identity was born. Caught between painfully low effort, quick buck anime adaptations and overly ambitious but poorly planned original shows, both Handshakers and Wise somehow managed to be the worst of both worlds. But Wise is at least the product of some kind of ambition, and I can't rightly rank that ahead of truly soulless garbage like our next entry. A few years ago, I made a video bemoaning the present state of licensed card game anime, calling for an end to the by-the-numbers insert toy-to-save-world storylines that have plagued the genre since Yu-Gi-Oh birthed it from its no-doubt spikily pubed loins. Card game anime is stale, I said. Give me something, anything, different, I begged. And in some dark, decaying corner of the anime industry, a lone, gnarled finger on a monkey's paw curled. In Season 5 of BoJack Horseman, Mr. Peanut Butter options the film rights to a birthday card, which he then attempts to turn into a feel-good family picture titled Birthday Dad, before ultimately pitching it to a TV station as an episodic supernatural drama about a ghost dad possessing people. This whole plotline is a big joke about how studios will make literally anything, so long as a sufficiently famous actor is attached and there's some existing IP to which it can be tied. And what sells that joke is the universal absurdity of the movie's premise. You don't need to be a Hollywood insider to understand intuitively that making a whole movie or TV show out of a nice looking piece of cardboard with no real story behind it is a bad idea. It's just one of those things that's so obviously dumb that nobody would do anything like it in real life. That's what makes it funny. On an unrelated note, our fourth place Winner, Bermuda Triangle Colorful Pastrel, is a slice-of-life comedy anime about pastry-eating mermaids based 
very loosely on some of the artwork from the trading card game Cardfight Vanguard. This, folks, is what the bottom of the barrel looks like after you've scraped past all the wood. Well, actually, to be fair, I do think that there's some potential in the idea of exploring card game lore in a beefier narrative format, and a lot of the clans in Cardfight Vanguard are based around really interesting high concepts, like the undead ghost pirates of Grand Blue, or the angelic doctors of the Angel Feather Institute, or Oracle Think Tank, the fortune-telling megacorporation whose CEO is the sun god Amaterasu. Any one of those could make for a fascinating, unique anime. And yet, they chose to go with the Mermaid Idols. Which, I guess, is still pretty novel, except that they made this a prequel story, so the only thing that makes this premise unique, the idol part, doesn't actually factor into this anime at all until the very end, and even then just barely. Oh, and also, the characters spend most of their time doing things that are physically impossible underwater in a town that was clearly designed for foot traffic, so... Beyond eliminating the need to animate walk cycles, them being mermaids doesn't seem to matter much either. So basically, this is just cute girls doing cute things, which doesn't sound that bad in and of itself. I mean, I love me some good, wholesome moe just as much as the next guy, but good is kind of the operative word there. Moe is an art form. It takes a lot of care and craftsmanship to make an animated character who is simultaneously cute enough and believable enough to trigger one's protective instincts. And uh, not to be too picky, but personally, I find it a bit difficult to see the cuteness in these characters or suspend my disbelief as to their existence when it constantly looks like their faces are melting. Like, Seven Arts Pictures, not to tell you how to do your jobs or anything, but maybe if you let your animators sleep or whatever, I wouldn't have to spend all day wondering if this mermaid colony is supposed to be situated near Bikini Atoll. Now at this point, some of you might be thinking, Jeff, you're being a weird meanie. This show is clearly intended to sell a card game to younger children, and expecting it to live up to your moe standards is, being honest, a little that kind of brony of you. Like, maybe stop and take a hard look at yourself. And I did in the middle of writing this, but then I also took a look at the PG-13 rating on the show's MAL page and all of the other things this studio has worked on, including Trinity 7, Basilisk, Vivid Strike, and Dog Days, the latter two of which were directed by the same guy. So I'm fairly confident that this is not a kid's show, despite every rough fiber of its aesthetic being screaming that it must be. It is almost certainly supposed to be a Moe show, it's just that bad at it. And it's also just really, really fucking boring in general. This is every cute girl's pal around a small rural town anime you've ever seen, only worse, with zero original thought given to any of its characters, themes, or storylines. Its main heroines aren't even defined beyond cookie cutter archetypes. You got the sweet one, the cool one, the ganky dumb one, the indecisive one who's finally found something to believe in, and the shy big city gal. And their designs are so generic, I don't think I even need to tell you who's who. There is a plot here of sorts about the girl's efforts to restore an old, disused movie theater to its former glory, but it's little more than a bare-bones skeleton on which the show's generic moe trappings are hung. Bermuda Triangle Colorful Pastoral is ultimately just a nothing show where nothing happens and nothing matters. And while I don't hate it, it's as hard to hate nothing as it is to love it, after all, I'm hard-pressed to think of anything this year that felt like a bigger waste of my time. Though if I had to, my third place pick, Pastel Memories, would certainly be a strong contender. It's nowhere near as boring as Bermuda Triangle, you could make an anime about watching paint dry and it wouldn't come close, but then Bermuda Triangle never gave me any reason to expect better. Whereas Pastel Memories at least hints at a bit of narrative ambition in its pilot episode, that episode introduces us to a nightmarish future future vision of Akihabara, where otaku media has all but faded into obscurity, and most of the legendary electric town has been converted into generic storefronts. So basically that, that bit from Steins Gate, only a whole series. The Rabbit Shed Shop Cafe is one of the last remaining strongholds of otaku culture, where customers can relax with a hot cup of coffee served by a waitstaff of cute schoolgirl maid cosplayers, and read some manga or light novels from the owner's personal library. At first, this episode seems pretty dull. It's just about one of those girls running around town asking after a rare light novel volume as unfunny moe antics ensue all around her. But as the episode ends, the show drops a bombshell. 
The slow death of otakudom is not some natural phenomenon, but actually a symptom of a supernatural virus distorting and destroying people's memories of anime and games and stuff. But the shop's employees have a secret way of fighting back. By diving into anime worlds, they can battle the viruses directly and save anime from destruction. So basically it's Kingdom Hearts, right down to the creepy, cute, heartless knockoff monsters, only with our heroes visiting low-rent parodies of popular anime instead of iconic Disney worlds. Oh, and instead of a naive shonen battle boy like Sora, those heroes are a team of beautiful waifus and cool, low-key, horny steampunk combat idol cosplay with weapons ripped straight out of Guilty Gear. And I am all about that. On paper, at least. And you know what? That, that sounds like a show I'd watch. All things considered, it's not a bad hook for a series to throw out leading into its second episode. Unfortunately, it's all downhill from there. Or possibly just from the third episode. I can't say for sure, because the second one doesn't really exist anymore. Apparently, the parody world of Welcome to the Rabbit Cafe was a bit too close to Is This Order a Rabbit for the license holder's comfort, and the whole thing got nuked off the internet Osomatsu-san style the day the last episode aired. Ironically turning part of this show about the tragedies of lost media into a piece of lost media itself. Okay, that's not technically true. It is the year 2019, and that episode is obviously still out there for anyone who wants to find it, but I don't. Honestly, I'll take any excuse not to have to watch any more of this show, because the last time I saw parodies this bad, I was still reading gaming webcomics. In the third episode, Spoof of Rose and Maiden, for instance, all of the show's iconic gothic Lolita dresses have been replaced with tracksuits, and that's it. That is literally the entire joke. Almost every subsequent parody is equally flaccid, if not more so, and on the rare occasions that the show does come up with a halfway decent premise for a joke, like the climax of the Dating Sim episode where all of the girls in Not Tokimeki Memorial are turned into murderous yanderes, it invariably flubs the execution of that joke with awkward pacing, bad voice acting, terrible writing, and messy animation. Most of the time, Pastel Memories isn't quite as ugly and stiff as either Bermuda Triangle or the next show on our list, but even then, it sure ain't pretty. And given that one of its main selling points is its big cast of hot girls, Gynax bouncing around in form-fitting costumes, who, if the stupid horny ED is any indication, are supposed to look more like this, that is a bit of an issue for it, though perhaps not as big an issue as those 12 girls' personalities, which can each be summed up in a single sentence and which are defined entirely by one otaku hobby and one quirky moe gimmick apiece. I honestly could not tell you off the top of my head what any of their names are, let alone which ones star in each episode, and that's not for the show's lack of effort. When it's not making a sincere effort to murder the very concept of humor itself, Pastel Memories attempts to tug at its otaku audience's heartstrings by playing up how much anime means to people. Unfortunately, as we've established, none of these characters really are people, so to say that these cloying scenes fall flat would be an understatement. The only part of that entire Rosen Maiden episode that got a laugh out of me was the bit where one of the girls, really couldn't tell you who, gets super sad because her friends no longer remember watching the show together or, uh, playing dress up with their dolls under some random gazebo. Okay, I get that the idea here is to evoke a general feeling of nostalgia, but without any context as to who these characters are beyond, I think one of them makes a lot of cat noises? It's kind of hard to care. And that really sums up my feelings on Pastel Memories as a whole. This shitty mobile game adaptation has some interesting ideas and some extremely gross ones too, actually, but it's all so bland and ineptly executed that I can't muster much in the way of an emotional response to any of it. Luckily, while the next anime on this list isn't any better, it is at least a lot more entertaining. Our second place finisher, Tri Nights, is the product of a rare collaboration between anime industry legends Gonzo, responsible for last year's worst anime list winner, Conception, and Seven, the same studio that subjected us to Nobunaga Sensei's wife, who is a child. The series is directed by Tokihiro Sasaki, whose other work includes that animated Amber Alert, as well as King's Game the Animation, a show that really speaks for itself. <laughs> <laughs> Although I won't let that stop me from roasting it in the near future. Anyway, given the impressive pedigree behind this series, I knew I was in for a real treat when I settled down to watch it. And I was not disappointed. 
though it did take a while to get there. Like many a formulaic sports anime, this series follows a pair of handsome, talented first-year high school sports prodigies with clashing personalities and complementary abilities who argue all the time because that's kind of like sexual tension, I guess. They eventually come together despite their differences to be good at sports and do better sports than other muscly sports boys at other sports schools. You know the sports drill. On the one hand, we have Akira, a handsome, naturally born athlete whose physical abilities verge on the superhuman on the other, there's Riku, a quiet, bookish nerd who really loves rugby but had to quit playing it in middle school because of anti-twink discrimination. This is a twunks-only sport, the team bullies insist when he shows up to practice the first time, but Akira's passion and incessant stalking eventually inspires Riku to give the game another try, revealing that he makes up for his weak physique with a keen mind for the strategy of the game. In line with the paint-by-numbers sports anime formula, the first few episodes are all about these characters sorting out their differences, which are symbolized in this case by an incredibly fucking stupid argument about whether athleticism or strategy is more important to winning rugby games. In these early episodes, Trinites appears to be nothing more than an aggressively average, unsubtly yaoi baiting pretty boy sports anime, albeit one rendered with a bit less finesse than is typical of the subgenre. The writing is quite clumsy, the suggestive dialogue is a bit, uh, blunt. The editing and pacing leaves a lot to be desired. We see about 10 minutes of these characters talking about rugby for every one of them playing it. There's also a lot of... Awkward pauses. And I'm not sure if you've noticed yet, but the animation and art isn't the best. The flaws are fairly subtle, but anyone with a trained artistic eye will pick up on the fact that human bodies don't do any of that at all, while anime connoisseurs like myself will also spot the subtle compositing errors that give away the show's otherwise seamless use of CGI. And if you can manage to tear your eyes away from the incredibly beautiful Bishi boys at center stage, you might also notice some of the background characters are missing a few, uh, pieces here and there. I don't know where this guy's face went, but I do know where the rest of him's going. Into my nightmares. Forever. Oh, sweet Jesus, Kunin moves! It would be easy to fill out this entire roast with nothing but cheap jabs at the show's production values. It is kind of just leaving itself wide open to them. Like, metaphorically speaking, this show is basically just standing there with its arms spread and a pathetic, longing, slack-jawed look on its face, staring at me almost like it wants me to hit it? Like it knows it deserves it. And, I mean, it is already dead inside anyway, so what would it really hurt to just wail on it a bit? Let it all out, you know? <clears throat> no, I must resist. Because to paint Trinites as being merely an obscenely ugly example of a subgenre that is specifically all about pretty people would be to miss the exquisite, hidden delights of this disaster piece. For only after a full three-episode test does this seemingly innocuous generic sports anime reveal that it is, in fact, completely and utterly cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. In episode three, our rookie protagonists learn the tragic backstory of the team's former captain, who had to give up on sports forever after playing an entire game of a violent contact sport on a busted knee without telling anyone he was hurt. You know, like an idiot would do. Moved by this story, the first years realize that the best way to motivate their disheartened senpais is to defeat the school that uh, happened to be playing against them that one time their captain fucked his own life up and then they lost anyway. Real compelling stuff so far, I know, but trust me, this is worth the build-up. The first years convey this plan to their seniors in something vaguely resembling dialogue, where the captain is all like, we couldn't beat Sekirei High School before, but now that you guys are on the team, it feels like we might be able to beat them this time. But then first year glasses kun is like, you think we can beat them? Well, I know we can beat them. To which the captain immediately responds, what, we can beat them? I never thought of that. Yeah. Anyway, after that, we cut to the other school's rugby club receiving their challenge in the fucking Imperial Throne Room that is apparently their clubhouse, where, dressed in red and black evil rugby empire tracksuits, they sit on ornate velvet cushioned chairs around an actual round table surrounded by checkerboard tile, stained glass windows, and a frescoed domed ceiling. And this is the music they play to introduce their captain, who apparently has some kind of grudge against Glasses Boy. Oh. 
Karma. Dick. Yeah, Tri Knights takes the Knights part of its title a bit more literally than I expected going in. While our protagonists come off as mostly obnoxious exaggerations of more generic high school sports anime idiots, the Sekirei team spends every second there on screen LARPing, essentially. Lots of dramatic bowing and gesturing, formal language, rallying and charging onto the pitch like an army, that sort of thing. They really commit to the bit. And I'm pretty sure the show thinks this is supposed to make them look cooler and more intimidating somehow, which only makes it funnier. This show kind of does a better job making fun of itself than I ever could. I'm learning that's one of Sasaki's strengths as a director. So I'll leave this at that for now and encourage you to check out the rest for yourself the next time you have some hammered buddies and intoxicants handy. Sorry I didn't get this out before New Year's Eve. Before we get to crowning our champion, I do have a few dishonorable mentions to mention for those of you who want to know more about bad anime for reasons. Magical Girl Spec Ops Asuka is perhaps the edgiest iteration of the edgy Magical Girls concept to date, and if you're looking for a hilarious hate watch, it is a fun one. So is Assassin's Pride, and if you haven't seen my roast of it yet, I'd suggest watching that after this. Grimm's Notes the animation is basically Kingdom Hearts at home, but even less sensical somehow. Like, come on guys, Don Quixote is not a Grimm's fairy tale. Kimono Friends Season 2 was about as bad as everyone expected it to be after they fired the only guy who made the last one good. Stand My Heroes, Peace of Truth has perhaps the least appealing high concept I've ever seen in an anime. It's an otome game adaptation where all of the love interests are narcs. You know, the fun cops. And it very nearly made this list on the strength of that pitch alone, but sadly, it's mostly just boring and unexceptional. I was also tempted to throw Do You Love Your Mom and her two-hit multi-target attacks on here after it got a little, uh, some might argue, predictably incesty, but I didn't want to make this video oops all isekai, and there were plenty of other strong contenders representing the genre. Picking just one to feature was actually a real challenge. The standout, at least as far as the internet's concerned, seems to be Ari Ferretta, which is a bit of a disaster, though nothing quite like the one that happened behind the scenes. From what I've been able to gather, the original light novel's author, Ryo Shirakome, was purportedly unhappy with White Fox's interpretation of his characters, and his complaints led to their work being scrapped and production switching studios just a few months before the show's originally scheduled air date of April 2018. The very predictable result of that decision was that new director Kinji Yoshimoto had a year and a half to remake the entire show more or less from scratch at a less established studio with less money. And it shows, it really shows, particularly in the abysmal first episode, but underneath the bad underlit animation, the terrible CGI, the giant enemy crabs, and the jittery pacing, Ari Ferretta does at least have a story with characters in it, like men and women with personalities who aren't the protagonists, some of whom make in-character decisions that affect the story in meaningful ways, and that's something I think more anime should do. Also, the OST is straight fire. <laughs> we need more jazzy dark fantasies. All things considered, it's kind of a miracle that Ari Ferretta is as watchable as it is in spite of all the problems it faced, and for all of its faults, at least it has a personality. By contrast, to see just how creatively bankrupt Isekai Cheat Magician is, you need only take a peek at its OP, which uses a noticeably phoned-in performance from Mythandroid, you know, the same band that opened for ReZero, Overlord, and Tanya the Evil, to underscore footage of painfully generic fantasy fights, as well as a shot of that one town from Konosuba, and the wise man's grandchild, and shield hero. The entire point of this OP seems to be to remind you of other, better anime you already like, in the hopes that the positive association might prompt you to give this one a try too. Because aside from some truly embarrassing animation, all Isekai Cheap Magician really has going for it is right there in the title. It's yet another isekai where a teenage nerd uses cheap magic powers to be the success he could never be IRL and land a bunch of hot girls who worship the very ground he walks on. It adds exactly one wrinkle to that formula by having his childhood friend come along for the ride and making her slightly less OP than he is, which has the potential to create some interesting conflicts by, say, having her be more eager to return home than he is, just for example but then it immediately squanders that potential by just making her another subservient girl in his harem. Oh, and quick side note to the author, if you're listening. 
I get that you probably spent a lot of time coming up with backstories and names for all the towns in this fantasy nation of yours, and I commend the effort. I think that's really cool. But just a suggestion, maybe having the characters sit down, point at a map, and rattle off those backstories from memory isn't the most organic or engaging way of conveying that information to your audience? Just a thought. Despite all my gripes with Cheat Magician, it is mostly just boring and unexceptional, again. And while it's doubtless one of the worst made anime this year, speaking personally, there's one in particular that I think is way worse overall. To its credit, our first place loser, High School Prodigies Have It Easy Even in Another World, does at least do something a little different with its isekai premise. Instead of one overpowered audience insert protagonist coming to another world from Earth, we have seven who represent a wide range of skills, specialties, and personalities, all working together to improve the strange world full of oddly hot elf and dog people they've landed in. There's Tsukasa, a political genius who killed his dad, Shinzo Abe, I think, to become the Prime Minister of Japan at 17. Masato, a brilliant businessman and the richest teenager on Earth. Ringo, a physics and programming prodigy whose AI can build anything and whose genius is the product of basically eugenics. Wait, what? Shinobu, the world's greatest ninja slash reporter. Kain, a beautiful teenage doctor who's essentially mercy with the medic psychosis, so that's fun. Aoi, a samurai who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with modern militaries, and Prince Akatsuki, a showboaty child magician. On paper, all of these prodigies are proper heroes with their own part to play in the story, but in practice only two of them, no points for guessing which ones, actually get to make significant decisions that affect the direction of that story. Though they were isekai'd in alongside them, and they do get more opportunities to do things that are cool than a background character would, the rest of the prodigies end up functioning almost identically to the battle harems in more generic isekai like Cheat Magician or Ragnarok, deferring to the wisdom of the male heroes pretty much whenever they're around, and using their talents mostly in service of others' plans. Even if those plans involve a master samurai and the most brilliant doctor on the entire planet prancing around in bunny suits to sell people religious mayonnaise. And look, I'm not gonna complain about a show depicting my exact fetish, but I do think that this approach is a lot less interesting, narratively speaking, than letting all of the so-called main characters actually act like main characters. Out of all of them, Prince Akatsuki is probably the one I hate the most. Part of that's his obnoxious personality, but most of it comes down to the way his character's handled conceptually. I'm actually a big fan of magic, Penn and Teller specifically, so I was really looking forward to watching an anime character go through the process of constructing illusions, and I was profoundly disappointed when I realized that High School Prodigies doesn't even do that once. I can't believe I have to explain this, but if you take a really talented illusionist character and then place them in a setting with real magic, you kind of need to show us how those fucking illusions work to justify their entire existence. Akatsuki is supposed to be from the real world, right? But when a lot of the plot revolves around his ability to fly and make buildings disappear with zero explanation as to how he does it, that kind of renders the magic system irrelevant and makes it all but impossible for me to suspend my already weighty disbelief toward this series. Despite these issues, the anime does have its good points. The animation's consistently well done, especially when it comes to fan service and action scenes. Those action scenes are pretty well directed, at least compared to their competition. And the script is decently written in the sense that a lot of the jokes land and are pretty funny. Also, on a conceptual level, I think the characters are unique and interesting, even if the execution of those concepts isn't the best and they just end up falling into anime tropes a lot of the time. If I were judging these series on their technical merits alone, I don't know that High School Prodigies would have even made this list, let alone topped it. But you know, I just got a real bone to pick with this show, a bias against it, if you will. Because putting everything else in its story aside, Boy, golly gee whiz, are its politics specifically ever dumb. And I'm not just talking about the eugenics thing, that is only the tip of this yikesberg. Now before any of you come at me for not keeping my criticism apolitical and objective or whatever, I just want to remind you that the main character of this anime is a politician, who the show repeatedly calls the world's greatest politician, and its main plot is about him building a new system of government with his good politician powers, one of which is shooting people. So it's not me bringing politics into this. They are already here in the most blatant, obnoxious, unsubtle way possible. And it 
physically fucking hurts me to see a show come forward with such audaciously preachy political ambitions as let's tell a story about a bunch of teenage geniuses using modern technology to rebuild an entire fantasy world's political system from the ground up in their own image, only to turn around and reveal that what they're building is just another modern capitalist democracy. I'm not saying that milk toast liberalism wouldn't be an improvement on this world's fascist empire. Almost anything would be, obviously, but there's other options, you know? There are a lot of things about the real world that suck too, so like, maybe you could use this never-in-a-lifetime opportunity to aim a little bit higher than the status quo. Sukasa, buddy, you have the power, resources, and knowledge to implement basically any political system you can dream of in a place with none of Earth's baggage. And your idea of a glorious people's revolution is to just kill the one ugly bastard who's most directly in charge of things where you are, and then let all of the nobles who facilitated his reign of tyranny not only keep all of their money, but also run the new government? I'm just saying, man, these people were the agents of a feudal regime whose official policies included using the army to kidnap local women for the Lord to abuse, and maybe some, most, or all of them deserve to pay for that with their lives, or at least their stuff. And maybe letting them off the hook because their wealth and connections are useful in the short term isn't the best way to ensure that the new democratic state you've put them in charge of building for some reason will be just and resistant to corruption in the long term. The show tries to write around the issue that its revolutionary heroes aren't actually all that revolutionary in the same way that SAO gets around its total lack of interesting characters, by having its villains be so cartoonishly evil and gross that even a milk dud like Kirito looks kinda heroic next to them. I mean, it copies that dynamic right down to the part where the greasy rich blonde villain chains up a busty elf and tears her clothes off in front of the hero with a knife, and of course it rings some fan service out of that sexual assault. <laughs> Hey, uh, writers, if you understand why that exact thing is bad, then why are you doing it with your show that you wrote? This stuff is gross and lame enough in your standard power fantasy anime, but it's a particularly pernicious writing trick to employ in such a preachy, politically charged plot, because it ends up implying that the problems in this world are purely the result of a few inherently bad people holding power. The hierarchical power structure they're abusing, meanwhile, is framed as a morally neutral tool that you don't need to worry about so long as an inherently good person's in charge of it. Okay, the problem with that line of logic is, of course, that most people aren't morally pure super geniuses with heterochromia or genetically evil, ugly bastards. And one day, inevitably, the system Tsukasa is building will imbue a handful of very average, mildly competent, morally fragile human beings with more power than any normal person can be expected to responsibly wield. But that just kind of conveniently never comes up. It is also wild to see an anime in 2019 talking a big game about people's revolutions when one of its main characters is a billionaire whose first big world-changing plan is to blackmail a mayor into giving him a business license so he can then use it to charge all the working class merchants in town rent. But that's okay, you see, because the guy who was doing it before was charging them even higher rent and being a real dick about it. And much like governments, monopolies only ever cause problems when bad people are in charge of them. <sighs> Masato literally doesn't do anything except acquire, hoard, and spend money. And the series, by way of a lolly cat girl who seems purpose-built to be a Twitter avatar, treats him like he's some sort of godly mega-genius for it. You know, Elon would probably like this. But really, Masato works as a stand-in for any billionaire philanthropist who's trying to find a way to save the world that conveniently doesn't involve them giving up any of their way too much stuff. Just like how Tsukasa works as a stand-in for any milquetoast centrist who pays lip service to progressive ideals while licking the boots of those same rich assholes. Basically, this show is about Chuni Pete Buttigieg and his Bashonen billionaire backer starting an entire magic civil war just to recreate the world we have now. And while other anime this year have been uglier and boringer and at times even more rage-inducinger, none of them come anywhere near being that existentially depressing for me. 
To think that an artist could go to the lengths of constructing an entire anime fantasy world and writing out a grand serialized epic narrative about its utopian evolution, only to end up saying, eh, this is as good as it gets, because for all that imagination they've failed to dream up anything better, that kills me a bit inside. I'm not saying this show would be better if it starred anime Bernie Sanders or whatever, but no, actually, that is what I'm saying. Bernie Sanders should be in this anime. And also, every anime, especially Cory in the House. That is the point of this video. Well, okay, not really. I mean, all of that is objectively true, and also, I'm right about everything. But the real point is for all of us to have some fun at the expense of anime with problems that I personally think are funny. And given how my brain works, this is the one that gave me the most to make fun of by far. High school prodigies may not be as poorly cobbled together as Wise, Bermuda Triangle, tri -Nights, or Cheap Magician, but in a way, that only makes it worse. Because surely there must have been a better use for all of that talent and passion than manufacturing this political mayonnaise. But that's just my opinion, and I'm sure a lot of you have opinions of your own, so I'd love to hear in the comments below which anime this year bothered you the most and why. Be it for ridiculous technical failings or intensely personal reasons, both of those are really fun. And if you loved hearing my opinions on this topic and have some friends who you think would also love them, maybe, I would really appreciate it if you'd share this video around. Even more than most of my videos, it took a lot of time and hard work to get done. Anyway, I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.